the 23rd of July 1986, around 500 million people watched as this lady married Prince Andrew, a day that changed her life forever. She was immediately transformed from Fergie to the Duchess of York, a very high rise in status, and one working at a local publishing company to now being Her Royal Highness. We'll look back at her starting life and how she came to such a position, her school years, her mischievous childhood and her working life. It's a tale of families and breakups, loves and losses. So join me now as we look at the carefree and independent Sarah Ferguson. And please like the video and consider subscribing for more historical stories. Sarah Ferguson is certainly not what you'd call an everyday princess. A woman known for her fun and games, not always suited to others. Yet Sarah was being Sarah. What other princess would you know that would hit her prince on his arm when the queen was watching? But Sarah was different and she knew what life was like for a so-called commoner. She worked, took bus rides and walked down the street unnoticed. But on that day in 1986, her whole world changed forever and she became part of the royal family. And now the press and photographers would swarm around her looking for that next big story. And to be fair, they wouldn't be waiting long for the gossip to start being created. In the eyes of many, she was a new woman, a new royal highness and a new duchess. So what could go wrong? More recently, a son or daughter of the royal family would have been expected to marry another connected with royalty and how things change. The queen, though, accepted Sarah, maybe due to the family background, where Sarah's father was said to have been on good terms with the royals. Sarah Margaret Ferguson was born in London on the 15th of October 1959. Her father was Major Ronald Ferguson. Her mother, Susan, had come from a wealthy Irish background. The Fergusons had two houses, one situated in the rolling hills of the English countryside and the other nearer to London. Dummerdown Farm in Hampshire was the family's principal residence, a Georgian brick-built dwelling with 800 acres of farmland. As children, Sarah and her sister Jane played happily together, and their love of horses meant they would spend many hours riding around the countryside. Sarah became an excellent horsewoman and was far more adventurous than her nervy sister. Sarah was brought up with a nanny on hand. Her parents were often away, Ritva Risu was the lady charged with looking after the children, and she once described them as being well-behaved and gentle. When Sarah began school, she was again well-liked. The teachers said she was a very happy child who had lots of fun. As she grew older, she would move to an all-girls boarding school. It was here now she would learn not only an education, but social classes, giving her a training that would become very useful later in life, especially one of high society. However, the strictness of the lessons and teachings of etiquette didn't change Sarah. She remained the joyful, happy child many had come to expect from her by now. Sarah was the prankster. She had that smiling face, but you never knew what her plan was next. She was the girl who would organise midnight feasts in the dormitory and the teachers thought they were all asleep. And although Sarah wasn't an outstanding student, she somehow mustered enough will to pass her exams. Yet when it came to sporting prowess, Sarah excelled, especially in swimming and horse riding. However, things were about to change. When Sarah was 13, her mother left the family home and set out to Argentina, where she would marry another man. It was a torrid time for Sarah. She was still in boarding school, so she would have had little to no knowledge about what had actually happened. Just three short years later, her father remarried, and now Sarah welcomed her new stepmother into the family. As time passed, Jane would also leave. She went to Australia with her new husband. Sarah and her father became closer than ever, and she would spend large amounts of time on the lawns at polo matches, where her father often worked for the royal family. But it was almost time for Sarah to leave home now. She would enter the capital city initially to get some practical work as a secretary. She then enrolled on a business course, studying typing, bookkeeping and shorthand. 
and Sarah made friends with Charlotte Eden. The pair of them knew they wanted some adventure before beginning the serious, or quite possibly more serious nature of getting a job, and more importantly, a career. They jetted to South America and decided to visit Sarah's mother's new home in Argentina. Their trip of a lifetime now complete, they returned to London, ready to start work. Sarah indeed used her talents to gain numerous appointments. She worked in an art gallery, a video company and public relations. Her nature and ability to get on with others soon brought new friends, alongside some well-heeled business contacts, to her life. Sarah never lost her playful nature. Her love of music and dance certainly kept her fellow workforce on their toes. Her holidays would include visiting the slopes of Switzerland. It was yet another pastime Sarah indulged in and became very proficient. It was around now that we started to see the personality that would become a household name one day. Her thick red hair and those steely eyes were very attractive to male suitors. She once said she'd like a man to look after her love and care, but wasn't sure if that man actually existed. But in the summer of 1985, Sarah found herself invited to join the royal family for a parade at the Royal Ascot Races. It would be on this occasion that she first met Prince Andrew. Within months, her life changed. She had once been the hard-working woman in a day-to-day -day job like many other public servants, and now had been seen as a princess. As romances go, this was indeed a whirlwind. Although Sarah and Andrew didn't know each other at all, it was upon the intervention of Princess Diana that the two first met. Diana and Sarah had known each other since childhood and throughout that time had remained friends. It would be their first public occasion, and the press jumped on this breaking story. It would be a sheer delight for the royal family. They could see how well the couple got along. And not only had Andrew found a suitable girl that he adored, Diana was also pleased that her best friend seemed to be getting along with her brother-in-law. Sarah didn't see that much of Andrew over the next few months. However, she continued to visit the polo matches and chatted with Diana. But it wouldn't be long before the couple were back together. The Queen had invited Sarah to stay at Sandringham over Christmas with the family. The Queen took to her son's girlfriend and the atmosphere was calm and very colloquial. It wouldn't take long for the public to find out there was far more to this new girl. She wasn't just a lady in waiting. Romance was the key. And Andrew held on to it as long as he could before the inevitable outpouring of speculation. Around this time, Sarah had her first brush with the British press. They followed her constantly, although she could not say anything about her relationship. Another month passed before the engagement was made official. The news that most saw coming would end the guessing games. Sarah is now showing off her ruby engagement ring and realizing that her life will now be very different. And it began the following day when an official car arrived to take her to her office. The press and police were out in force and it would soon be that Sarah Ferguson would now be a member of the royal family. Andrew was said to be charming and happy-go-lucky and at the time a popular member of the firm. As Queen Elizabeth's third child, he was born on the 19th of February 1960. He said Andrew was himself like Sarah when growing up, full of mischief and full of energy. He was also categorised as the Royal Joker, maybe another unfortunate title that has since been redefined in the past few years. Before the meeting, the couple lived relatively close by and would see each other at polo matches. Yet while Sarah's life was quite relaxed, Andrew's was far more strict and disciplined. Andrew excelled in the forces, becoming a helicopter pilot and serving in the Falklands War. He gained great respect and achieved distinguished merit for his achievements. The couple seemed well matched and it looked like the marriage decision would work out perfectly. The wedding date was set for the 23rd of July 1986, but much work had to be done before then. The all-important job of who would design Sarah's wedding dress. As the day closed in, rehearsals and further preparations continued. Invitations were now sent, and it was time for the final countdown. The famous state coaches trundled out, Sarah, Andrew, and the rest of the royal family, all ready 
for their journey to Westminster Abbey. The night before the wedding, Sarah stayed with the Queen's mother at Clarence House. It was a time when she gave her own words of advice to a bride to help them through their big day. Linda Searack, an unknown designer, made Sarah's dress. As she produced a stunning dress made with ivory colored silk, delicate beadwork and embroidered. In New York, tailors had copied the dress within an hour and a half, selling it for $250. In London, imitations were created by 5 p.m. with a price of around 1,500 pounds. No pressure on Sarah then for this public wedding, attracting a worldwide audience of 500 million, which was quite possibly something she never envisaged. The couple took their vows and Andrew placed the Welsh gold ring on Sarah's finger. The ceremony was over. All that was left now was to make their way back to Buckingham Palace. They were greeted on the balcony by many thousands of royal fans. The couple waved and kissed each other, but it was time to leave. Sarah had no idea where she was going, but Andrew had arranged a secret honeymoon. It turned out to be aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia, just off the coast of the Azores, a group of islands about 800 miles from the coast of Portugal. As an added bonus to the couple the day before the wedding, Andrew was announced that the Queen had made him the Duke of York, and Sarah would also gain a title as Her Royal Highness, the Prince Andrew, Duchess of York. It was quite possibly for Sarah the perfect ending to her fairy tale story. But was this the start of something exceptional, or were things about to take a turn for the worse? Although Sarah had worked all her life, it was something the Queen now disapproved. She had responsibilities as a princess and duchess, and although the Queen understood Sarah's background, she was clearly cautious in her thoughts that continuing in the same way would be dangerous and challenging for the police to protect her. After the honeymoon, both Sarah and Andrew lived in the second room floor at Buckingham Palace, but although Andrew was still away for long periods of time with the Navy, Sarah got stuck into life as a royal. She became involved in charities and would travel around the UK representing the Queen at formal occasions. Her life had been turned upside down and although she still worked full time, her current job was unlike any other. It was around now her father came under scrutiny. The Wigmore Club, a health club and massage parlour in London staffed by females who were clad in starched white medical gowns purportedly gave a la carte sexual services to members. The story first appeared in the News of the World in 1988. When asked about his use of the club, he said that he only went there for straightforward massages and a cocoon in which I could ponder for an hour. But in spite of the scandal, he was able to maintain his wife and his position as the Prince of Wales polo manager and at the Gods Polo Club. But news improved later that year when Sarah and Andrew announced their first child, Beatrice, born on the 8th of August. The second child was born two years later, Eugenie, on the 23rd of March 1990. Although the press could be cruel at times, when Sarah struggled with her weight during pregnancy, she was reported as the ghastly Fergie, and Fergie is a frump. But she stood firm and throughout the criticism held her head high, although privately, it did deeply hurt her. The fairy tale romance, one which came at speed, was now slowing. Not just lethargy, but increasingly difficult to steer through the growing troubled waters. So what had gone so catastrophically wrong? Sarah's life as a royal was on the rocks, and she was becoming paranoid and maybe lost her grip. It would be 1993 that she secretly visited her lawyer in London. The discussion was one of divorce. The couple agreed to share custody of their two daughters and the family continued to live at Sunning Hill Park until the Duke moved to the Royal Lodge in 2004. Sarah's afterlife away from the Royal family would be somewhat different to what she experienced within the so-called firm. She said one still has to live one's life, but the palace was now speaking a different language. One insider said, they had had their fill of Fergie. It's simply a case that enough is enough. Yet the campaign against Sarah accelerated and started to take shape, albeit a bad one. 
It would be four years for the divorce to come through finally, in that time which water had inevitably gone under the bridge. Affairs, secrets and even the kissing of toes had not escaped the media circus. Ridicule was now at the centre of everything Fergie and she was coming to an end. Sarah received around £15,000 a year from her divorce settlement, with the majority of her money now coming from a role within Weight Watchers. Yet the strange thing is Sarah was still classed as a member of the royal family, if only as a courteous attempt to heal wounds. She was once asked if she'd ever remarry Andrew, to which she replied, He's still my handsome prince. He'll always be my handsome prince. Although since December 2021, she is no longer listed on the Royal Family website under the heading Members of the Royal Family. Sarah had mounting problems no more so than her crippling debt, which had reached over £4 million. The Queen intervened, stating that she would not be stepping in to settle any debts. Sarah knew the firm meant business. She was on her own and sailing into stormy waters. Men would come and go. Business opportunities looked good but proved fruitless and her mission was in all likelihood set to fail. In May 2010, Sarah was filmed by a News of the World reporter, claiming that her former husband had agreed that if she were to receive £500,000, he would meet the donor and pass on useful top-level business contacts. She was filmed receiving in cash $40,000 as a down payment. The paper claimed that the Duke did not know of the situation, but in July 2011, Sarah stated that her multi-million pound debts had been cleared due to the intervention of her former husband, whom she compared now to a knight on a white charger. But for Andrew, more urgent matters were now surfacing, and ones that would lead to the most damaging results ever for the royal family. There were calls for Andrew to resign his trade ambassador in March 2011, because of his association with Jeffrey Epstein, an American financier and since 2008, convicted sex offender. When Sarah, his ex-wife, revealed that he helped arrange for Epstein to pay off £15,000 of her debts, the Duke came under fire in the media as well. In December 2010, Andrew was pictured with Epstein, strolling around Central Park on a trip to New York City. His trade envoy duties were ended in July of that year, and he is said to have severed all contacts with Epstein. Pressure on Buckingham Palace to clarify Andrew's relationship with Epstein resurfaced in January 2015. And according to Buckingham Palace, any claim of inappropriate conduct with youngsters was totally untrue. You can say categorically that you don't recall meeting Virginia Roberts, dining with her, yep. dancing with her at Tramp, Yep. or going on to have sex with her yes. in a bedroom in a house in Belgravia. I, I can absolutely categorically tell you it never happened. Do you regret the whole friendship with Epstein? <laughs> I, I, now, I, I still not. And the reason being is that, that the, the people that I met um, and the opportunities that I was given to learn um, either by him or because of him, were actually very useful. While Prince Andrew claims to have met Epstein in 1999 through Maxwell, Duke's private secretary claimed in 2011 that the two had first met in the early 1990s. But the Queen had none of this and within days, Andrew had been taken out of royal circulation. His life in tatters and in order to emphasise Andrew's retirement and public life, his social media accounts were deleted. In January 2022, his profile on the Royal Family's website was rewritten in the past tense, and his military affiliations and patronages were removed. The ongoing media reports continue to this day. For Sarah, a final instalment would prove the fatal blow, leaving her public persona behind to retreat back into private life. The one thing she had to do was reinvent and start again, now her only option. She agrees that she was never really cut out for royal service, and try as she might to attempt to change into the perfect royal host, it was simply one page too much in her autobiographical life. However, Sarah did say, if the opportunity arose again, she would take it and follow her heart. 
Buckingham Palace will never change and the fall from grace was quite possibly one of the worst moments of my life. Sarah continued, the tabloid humiliation and the slapdowns hurt, but I failed to learn the painful lessons. Sarah ultimately sailed too close to the wind while attempting to chart a way out of the mess. In the years after her divorce, Sarah was, as we've seen, subject of scandals that affected her relationship with the royal family. More recently, especially on the wedding of her daughter, which was both attended by the Queen and Prince Philip, a man who hated the sight of her. But maybe now the divides are healing, as she has also appeared in other various royal events in recent times. She said, I couldn't change history, and even when looking back, I can hold my head high even though it wasn't to the approval of all. I'll always be the mother of two princesses and the second son's ex-wife. The scrutiny and discourse that came along are too significant to attempt to consider. I am my own woman, ready to go forward. And who knows, I might live rather happily ever after.